would have thought? Here we are on My 11 Circle Presents Crick Buzz Live, trying to analyze what could easily have been 120, 130, 140. But when you've won five World Cups, what is it that you exactly do? 79 for five, the opposition all over you, balls flying all over the place, few batsmen having got hit on the helmet. And then you turn around and make 288 with your batsman batting at number eight, scoring 92 of 60 deliveries, Nathan coulton -Isle. Certainly they had a glue in Steve Smith who kept things going. But Nathan coulton -Isle decided that it was going to be his day, the third highest score at number eight in ODI history. And a bit of uh, contribution from Alex Carey as well. What it did mean is completely unexpectedly, I'm also the recipient of the My 11 Circle expert couch. Yes, here it is. Look at this. You can see it much better in this nice wide shot. So before I go to our experts, let me just... Why not? I have to gloat a little bit. But I must say, it's not one of those days when you want to gloat because I didn't think anyone was getting there. No, I thought, yes, so that, I thought that call to the Australian team management at that point in time from your side was very useful. I mean, they had to put in this performance for you to build this couch. And was it a call what, to them what or he, to the West? What it didn't yeah. do? <laughs> what he actually didn't do, Australian team was doing it out there. <laughs> yeah, I thought backing themselves up. <laughs> you didn't really back yourself. No, I didn't really back. <laughs> but yeah, but but Steve Smith was there, and and that was the reason in the in the first cricket bo uh, com box as well. You know, I was, uh, I was I was trying to mention that. You know, with Smith out there, you never know what's going to happen. But if he gets the support like how we got today, I think you know, then something special is going to happen, which uh, which we saw, which we all witnessed. Uh, you know, Nathan Coulton Isle is a natural cricketer, you know, and and uh, with his bat, he had not really made that kind of impact for for Australian team as yet. But today was uh, his day, you know, and he's, he he just took the opportunity and and proved that okay, you know, that all rounder uh, tag which he has uh, is how much it's worth. And uh, to play a special innings like this was uh, what was required uh, for Australia. Someone needed to uh, stand up and deliver and Coulton Isle certainly did. What's the message it's sending now to the rest of the teams? Because here you are, they've had the first game, not an easy one, but relatively easy opposition in Afghanistan. They professionally finished that off. In this case, you see they're 79 for 5 against a team who have demolished Pakistan and they've just gone and put on 288 on the board, showing the depth they have in the batting. No, no, absolutely. And then look at that. I mean, this is such a great, great batting card. Exactly as you said, 79 for 5. And then Carey puts, puts up his hand. This thing puts up his hand. Steve Smith puts up his hand. Of course, school to line. He's been absolutely fantastic. The important thing about it is that that 102 run partnership for the seventh wicket, six wickets, 62 odd runs. I mean, these are big partnerships. Most importantly, it's coming back. They're coming back and doing it at a time when they're back against the wall. These games early in a tournament are fantastic. Just one more thing to observe there. Just look at contribution of Steve Smith at that stage, 30 of 35. He realized he was staying till the end. Seeing Pultonal go well at the end, he could have. It could have been reversal of roles. Okay, he's got the tail with him. He could have been the one accelerating, but he saw. Okay, someone else can do it. I just need to play a 30 of 35. I'm fine. In fact, he was much, much slower before that, and he actually sort of speeded up yeah. only in the last three, five, four, five hours. Did he speed up? So it was a fantastic performance in the way they did it. They ebbed, they flowed. Then Steve Smith started going, and he needed a wonderful catch to get him out. Because if Steve Smith had batted another 10, 15 uh, balls, I'm sure he would have caught up almost with 100 in the strike rate. But this is an important match for them because it's a show of character very early in the tournament. The other kind of games, this is like a couple. They have 17 for five and you suddenly come back. It gives the team so much. Yeah. And Australia will take a lot from it. It certainly does. And you mentioned that catch. I mean, I know it will be forgotten slightly because of all the runs they've put on. Uh, that was a time he was really stepping on the gas. He played that flourish of a shot. You saw, here comes six. I was thinking, OK, forget me. I mean, you two came into contention for, for the My 11 Circle Expert couch. But what a catch from Cottrell. We're seeing some uh, great fielding skills in uh, in this World Cup. And, and, and that certainly was uh, wicket fully deserved uh, by Cottrell. You know, he it is just piece of brilliance <laughs> yeah. in the field. There's nothing wrong uh, with the shot. You know, the, the the shot was on. He played that beautifully as well. Uh, and uh, and uh, and someone uh, had to create a piece of magic only to 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 turn it other uh, otherwise in that situation. But on the whole, I felt uh, that uh, that West Indies uh, went in with a with some great planning. I think uh, their planning was uh, was spot on in turn and working as well. But they got little carried away when the ball was slightly older. 
you know that there's suddenly extra bounce in the wicket but after 30 overs you know when when both uh, the new balls are about 15 17 uh, over old that time they should have uh, opted for just slight change in tactics uh, you can't be too critical of them because you know that's something which had worked for them and they just kind of stuck with that uh, but uh, but that that phase when when Coulter was in you saw that initially he was uh, he was not settled and then there was uh, they persisted with that uh, short ball tactic uh, which had uh, given them results in the match but I think at that stage maybe they needed to just be a little proactive in that phase of the game uh, could have uh, gone otherwise but uh, nothing taking away from Coulter's innings I think it was it was one of the best innings uh, in recent times uh, that we've seen in terms of revival of an innings and, and come back into the match I have one more point I mean I'm just a bit I find it a bit strange like Breathweight is really the bowler that they're looking at saying okay five from you know Russell five from Breathweight and he bowls 10, okay, he, he managed to get some wickets, but those are, you know, garbage wickets. In the end, somebody's whacking the ball, he gets caught at long on, that's hardly a wicket. Jason Holder has bowled 7. Jason Holder has bowled only 7 wickets, there are three, well, 3 overs he hasn't bowled. And I, I'm, when you know that these batsmen have got away, they've got a 100-run partnership in the middle, Jason Holder is one of their best bowlers. I mean, he and Roshan Thomas are the leaders of that attack, I mean, why didn't he bowl? I just don't understand it. Yeah, he, he could have, but I think, you know, the, clearly uh, in this... Um, West Indies set up, there were, there were a few things which I liked as well, like, you know, O'Shea and Thomas bowling in those small bursts, Russell bowling in those uh, small bursts and picking wickets. So, there's there's certainly a plan going in in, in that plan because you've, you've seen today from the first match to this match, uh, Jason Holder hasn't started the innings, you know. So, so uh, he was uh, possibly seeing himself bowling with that new ball and then coming in uh, in the middle overs, not really uh, an option in terms of uh, bowling the death overs. So, that's something which the planning must have happened and, and, and that's why he refrained from bowling himself and got uh, uh, Brathwaite on in, in, in that kind of scenario. Um, it's a long tournament, so going forward, they will be, uh, you know, figuring things out uh, uh, for for sure because uh, O'Shane uh, coming in early and uh, taking the new ball has worked for them. So, they might want to continue with that. Yes, Jason Holder bowling in that uh, back end of the innings, maybe going forward, you will get to see. There's been a suggestion that he tends to shy away occasionally. I'll give you a quick example. In the Caribbean Premier League, captain of the Barbados Tridents, there was a key game where everyone was looking at Jason Holder to bowl a final over in a situation where the opposition was could have run away with it. And he didn't bowl the final over. He gave it to a young man called Dominic Drakes, son of Vasbar Drakes, and he got hit for 30 runs in that over. And everyone was... 30 runs? Play. Yeah. Four, four sixes? Well, uh, almost. But okay. between 28 and 30 yeah. runs. Not only was the poor guy, young man's confidence shattered, but the opposition got uh, 15 runs more than they were bargained for. So, the suggestion was he sometimes tends to shy away from that. Otherwise, very calm-headed person. Uh, but that's what, as a bowling captain. Yeah, I mean, look, between Brathwaite and him bowling, he's clearly a superior bowler to Brathwaite. Brathwaite will just angle it in at a particular length and, you know, hope to get somebody get a miss it. But... Yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, as, as you said, you know, these tactics will evolve. Yeah. He'll go back to the dressing room. Yeah. Maybe the coach might tell him, well done. But, you know, yeah, we would like to see you bowl a little more. Maybe the rotations haven't come worked out. But you're right. I think uh, Brathwaite certainly is not the ideal choice uh, to, to finish the innings. You know, that's that's something which they'll have to definitely uh, sit and work around. That, okay, what are our, our best options in terms of... Uh, Using in the in, in the back end of the innings uh, today, they maybe didn't feel the need of of keeping their uh, main uh, main bowlers uh, who are uh, who are back end specialist, a death over specialist. Uh, but but these things you'll see. I mean, all in all, I think you know it's 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 a perfect setup for a, a good game of cricket because uh, because we thought it's going to be a one sided uh, encounter. It's certainly not going to be the case, you know. So the uh, Australians have come back into the game now. West Indies uh, will will have to uh, will have to just uh, focus on the second innings, finish the job, you know, because because so far, if you if if, if you look at the match, uh, you would want you would expect. Uh, West Indies to uh, to win the match, you know, because they've done most of the things right. Uh, so, so I think in this mid innings, they should be just, you know, uh, focusing on uh, on not losing the momentum, and you know, just you know, be in that positive uh, frame of mind. Focus on things which have gone their way in this match. It's a hard thing to do because you know but, this, but this is what happens because uh, say around 25-30 uh, uh, overs. 
all all the batsmen also you know who are who are fielding at that stage for for west indies must be thinking okay today is going to be that easy day and now suddenly they have to alter that thought process so it's it's, it's just about you know staying in that zone and making sure uh, you you finish the match and then go back to the the drawing board and, and figure out okay what they could have done uh, differently uh, to to close the game early but my question is haven't they already lost the momentum because at one stage of the innings, at 79 for 5, I mean, I'm not saying 120, 130, they would have been mentally switched on to chasing maybe 200 even, right? This is our day, we can finish this match off. Now, suddenly 289, have a look at this, how they got there, that 9.11 at a stage when you're batting with number 8 and 9 there for a large part is huge credit to, to Australia. True, but just even if you look at a mini sort of turn, I mean, those last two overs, they could have reached 300. I mean, two catches in the boundary. I mean, the way Coulton Isle was going, they could have reached 300 very easily. They finished off with an over to spare. And remember, I mean, you had all sorts of, you know, none of the other guys could really time the ball. So, they could have reached 300. The guys said, okay, we pulled it back a bit. Maybe they're 10, 15 runs short of where they were. Who knows? See, they have to take something positive back out of this. And uh, see, the other thing I believe is that this is not a West Indies team that will finish at 247 for six. I mean, either they're going to go and you know, the kind of batsmen. Either 180 all out or they win the game. Yeah, yeah, the kind of exciting batsmen they have. I don't think scoring will be a problem. It's just keeping wickets. I think. But I think uh, you you look at the Australian innings, okay, and, and and you see how many good balls have got batsmen out, and you'll find that not not many good balls have uh, got batsmen out. So it it wasn't a, a result of conditions that got them wickets. You know, it was it was a result of good tactics, good planning, which uh, which which got them uh, wickets. If you uh, look at apart from that first Finch's wicket, which was a beauty oh, of beauty. a delivery. That was a beauty. Apart from that, if you see that uh, there were soft dismissals, you know, ap apart from that, you would see that uh, there was some uh, some some good planning and soft uh, uh, soft batting. Is what uh, what I, uh, I I felt that was happening at the in the match situation. So West Indies batsmen will have to uh, talk amongst themselves around those lines. You know, it's a good wicket to bat on. You've seen that even if we got four wickets, they could just put up a a, a partnership and uh, and it, it was not uh, it was not looking very alarming. You know, there was no demons in the track that you would uh, you would scare. It's still a true wicket. Yes, there is extra bit of bounce uh, for the spin. Also, there is not much of a help. We'll have to see how Zampa goes about his uh, his his his, uh, his bowling. We'll have to see how Maxwell. Uh, Bowls and how uh, Finch uses Maxwell in this uh, this innings in the absence of line because uh, yeah because they have uh, five uh, five left handers in the in the top order from West Indies point of view Gale will be uh, certainly the key you know because uh, because of the build up to the match uh, you would expect that uh, Gale gives them the kind of start which which they are banking him on. Uh, so, so if, if those things happen, then suddenly you'll see a, a, a different kind of game. All in all, but from Australia's point of view, all the bowlers will be upbeat, you know, because because when you have runs on board, uh, you you know that okay, you have a chance. You just have to do the things right, make use of that new ball, get uh, get early breakthroughs, and and build pressure. Uh, so it'll, it'll, it'll be a good match to see. The second innings is going to be the most exciting one now in this match. Certainly will be. What's what's Gale's record like against the Australians? I mean, let's we keep harping on that one six he hit of Bretley at the Oval, but uh, overall record twenty six point seven three. So not that he reads records too often, but uh, it's something he'll want to improve on and look at this as a one off where he can really explode. This year we showed you already has been wonderful for Chris Gale. Every time he's walked out, his lowest score has been 50. Let's show it to you one more time before Chris Gale comes out to bat. 50 of 34 was just the other day in a small run chase, but a couple of those were explosive innings, particularly the ones in Barbados and Grenada, uh, part of huge totals against England. But uh, yeah, I mean, Chris Gale is going to be, but I think to sum up what Zahir Khan said really is something that they'll have to echo in the dressing room. Other than Finch, you can imagine Maxwell trying to go for a shot. He shouldn't have Kwaja going, making room and getting caught. Towards the end, a couple of wickets that were really cheap, or garbage wickets, that's the term you use, which is absolutely fair enough. And Steve Smith with a brilliant shot, but I mean, it's just a great catch. So I think it's a very good point he makes that uh, they'll go in there and say that no, we were not blasted out or the opposition wasn't blasted out, so we can make the runs. Absolutely. I think they'll, they'll, they'll reckon they can do this and they would have said, at the beginning of the day, forget about what happened in the first 50 overs. If somebody had said 288 yeah. is a target, 289 is a target, would you have taken it? I think they would have said anything below 300 we'd take. You know? Yeah.
Let, let's not forget that even 400 was was okay for them to chase down. So uh, sort of mentally, they are switched on to, to thinking about targets like that. And sometimes when you see big scores, you're almost saying that you can salivate. It's not one of those dangerous totals where you get complacent. So there's no question of complacency. Go out there, play West Indian style. And that's, they don't know any other style in any case. So, you're not going to suddenly see them. You know, there are no Chanda Pearls in this team who's going to, you know, sort of do that for you. So, yeah, they'll go for it. One more reminder, actually, before we talk about the bowling, is of the achievement of Nathan Coulton. Uh, third highest ODI score, batting at number eight. And uh, have a look at this. Chris Walks, 95 at Trent, Trent Bridge. Guess where? At Trent Bridge against Sri Lanka. And Dre Ras, 92 at North Sound against the Indians and this is number three in that list. No one still got 100 at number eight. We've seen records even lower down than that. Um, so I think, yeah, Nathan Coulton, of all the bowlers, I know we talked about Stark and everyone. As a bowler yourself, right, when you, when you maybe put a few runs on the board, did it give you that extra spring in the step? It does. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. He's, he's going to carry the confidence now in his uh, bowling as well, so which is a good sign. You, know, they, uh, you always see that uh, when, you've, when you've batted well, you'll go out there and, uh, and, and you'll be upbeat and you'll get... Things are falling into place you know, with that confidence. So that's something which you can expect from Kulton Al, but, uh, but I think uh, today's innings is, is right up there. Because they're down and out, completely, uh, you know, nowhere in the game, and uh, and to get your team back in such a, a decent position and a strong position at at midway, you know, you can uh, take a lot of pride in in, in this kind of performance. And uh, I'm I'm sure Kultanal, when he goes out there to bowl as well, it'll it'll show it'll show that you know the the rhythm is there, the, there is a there's a spring in his steps and uh, and and a lot of fire and and bit of uh, chirp as well. You know, it reminds me of somebody you would have seen a lot of. 2003 World Cup, their secret performer was Andy Bickle. If you remember one match against England, they had completely collapsed. He came back, got runs for them. He was not the most hardly regarded fast bowler. You know, there was Bretley, there was Glenn McGrath. But Bick was the guy who got them through crucial matches. He won a match with his bat, got some got a seven-wicket haul. And that's exactly what, you know, when you're the third bowler in their attack and you come through and do things then do a bit with the bat, you know, you suddenly it changes. The in fact, it was Bickle's record in World Cup context yeah. that Coulton Isle broke in terms of the highest scores at that number. Oh, absolutely. So and they're perfectly that third seamer, less regarded. He might have been played instead of Josh Hazelwood. And he just, he's taken his chance and run with it. So what's your tactic now? The words have been said to Chris Gale. The runs are on the board from Australia. What's your tactic now to Chris Gale? Because in the context of, say, IPL cricket, T20 cricket, you're often looking at the off-spinners getting rid of him. So it's not going to be an off-spinner to Chris Gale. You're not going to throw the ball to Glenn Maxwell early on. Chin music? There's no doubt about it. I think uh, they'll stick to the same formula because something which uh, which has worked for them as as a bowling unit. Uh, this Australian bowling uh, bowling unit is looking good. So they uh, they have uh, three good quicks uh, in Mitchell Stark, Pat Cummins, and uh, Coulton Al himself. Uh, Zampa is uh, uh, going to be crucial as well. Uh, there is a little bit of help for the spin. Uh, we saw Nurse also did a, a decent job for, for West Indies. So we'll have to wait and see how Zampa goes about it. Uh, uh, in terms of their fourth seam option, they have Stoinis. So, so this bowling lineup is, is good enough to defend uh, at par uh, totals. So, so we'll have to wait and see how they go about it in terms of taking those early breakthroughs because that is going to be the key. Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll see uh, likes of Evan Lewis and uh, Chris Gale if they're set on these uh, these kind of surfaces and with uh, short boundaries, short dimensions of the ground, they can be a, a, a force to reckon with. So that's something which uh, Australian bowlers will, will have to be wary of. Uh, in terms of uh, short ball tactic, you'll again see it from the Australian team as well because that's something which has worked on on, on this surface. Uh, you've seen it in, in, in few matches now. So that's something which they'll start with. But uh, but we'll have to see, you know, whether they persist with that for a long time or that, whether that gives them the result. Because West Indies, uh, West Indies batsmen will certainly be expecting those kind of uh, tactics from Australian bowlers. Yeah, all it takes is three uppercuts for six and, <laughs> and that might be the end of it. But Stark could be a little bit rusty because uh, while he might be have the pedigree, he hasn't had the experience in the last maybe 20 ODIs. Yeah, he's like a very expensive Ferrari, you know. Really good but requires a lot of maintenance. And every time you think you have one run at it, suddenly back to the garage, so that's more, some more tinkering. So he's there, you know, he's a Rolls Royce of their bowlers. Okay, too many car analogies out here. But that's my point that 
he just breaks down too often. He's not a workhorse and, you know, in the last few, last year or so, he's played just one-third of Australia's one matches and that's a ridiculous percentage. I mean, one-third of Australia's one-day matches, they've obviously been saving him for some reason also. But a fast bowler, Zach, of that calibre, why does he break down more often than the others? Is there anything particular about his action or what is it that makes him break down so often? Not really. I think, you know, this uh, doesn't look like it's, uh, it's, it's the action. But injuries is something which a fast bowler doesn't really have uh, control over. You just got to uh, give yourself the best chance of, of not really uh, going through that. But if, if it happens, you have to make sure that you do the needful and 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 also it's it's been a tactic from australia as well to make sure that he's fit for uh, the Big main problem. tournaments Ashes you know yeah up. so so uh, partly it was due to injury partly also it was uh, because of uh, workload management as 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 they've been calling it recently <laughs> in terms of making sure that you know you are not uh, burning yourself out and they're finding ways of of keeping you on track for 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 longer time because injury kind of puts you back uh, in uh, in your run to uh, to to success and also you know to to create those kind of impact and especially if someone is bowling 145 plus you know it takes a lot out of your body so you got to be careful as well yeah it's it's a good uh, parallel you said uh, 150 kilometers an hour it could be the ferrari and you've saved it for the right like such and used to <laughs> only on the pune express where you yeah. can't drive it in we'll bandra and purel yeah. <laughs> so you have to drive in the right place so i think stark has found he's had a nice workout against afghanistan got the speeds up and i think uh, the ferrari looks like it's working for him but just a final one you know I think the summary has got to be, be so much we've talked about Chris Gale, but we mentioned it and see one last mention at the end of the show that it's not just about Gale, it's about the Lewises, it's about the Shea Hopes, Hetmeyer, Russell, Brathwaite, they've in got, fact, and Puran. In fact, that's what I want to say. One of the interesting things is, if you look at it, Gale and, you know, the two names you'll keep hearing in India, Gale and Ray Russell, they're actually the guys who don't actually hit the short ball very well because of the way they play. They prefer to leave it and wait for length. All the other guys, they play the uppercut, they play the pull. All the other guys aggressively go after the short ball. So if they're going to go after short balls, it's Gale and Russell who, who are most likely to let them go and see it. So the battle will really be the, how the other four play that. And it'll be interesting. All right. And you look uh, at this batting lineup as well. You know, there is there's enough potential to, uh, to get, get big scores. So I don't think they'll be very scared of this 288 uh, uh, total. They just, they just need to uh, put together a few overs together and few partnerships. I think uh, they, they should be fine. And I'm, I might, uh, you might see that uh, Jason Holder also been, been promoted up the order in, in, in between because he's someone who plays spin very well because they have power at the, uh, at the top in, in Evan and Chris Gale and, and power at the bottom as well in Cra uh, Carlos Brathwaite and, and Russell. Russell. Well, he's, he's the captain. So, so even though they leave too much in the last 10 overs, you, uh, uh, you can't relax as, uh, as Australian team, they can't relax, you know. So, so that's something which, which, which will be interesting to see. It's just about uh, that middle phase, you know, how they go about it, you know, are they too too aggressive in that middle phase or, or, or playing according to the, the, the merit of the ball and building that partnership uh, is, is what we'll have to wait and watch. He's a big guy, you don't argue with him. If he's captain and says, I want to bat, go on, okay, Osko. Go ahead and bat. All right, chance for you to get back the couch maybe? Yeah. I'll give it a try, but you know. I know, I know that he's leaning towards West Indies winning. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to my prediction. Okay. Uh, you want to give us a rough over? or? Well, It'll be a close game, is is uh, what I'm thinking. Uh, say around 47, 48 hours. Okay. Uh, I like the West Indies. So I'm wondering whether I should go with the West Indies and then be doubly happy if they win and sad if they lose, or to hedge my bets. Go with Australia and therefore see what it is. No, I think I'll go with the West Indies, 45th over. All right. So I, I'm definitely sticking with Australia there. Again, I love the Windies. Uh, uh, visa's already stamped, by the way, in case you're talking about that. <laughs> my, for my next trip, so I'm going to stick with uh, Australia. It's, uh, I think they've put about 30, 40 runs too many. Mentally, what they were expecting to, uh, to challenge. So it's going to be uh, Australia by uh, 50 runs. That's my prediction there. So there we have it. That's uh, My 11 Circle presents Craig Bars Live. Uh, no changes still in the rules, so we're not going to be able to reassess in the 15th over. All we'll do is give you a bit of assessment into where the game stands. Craig Buzz Combox in the 15th. <laughs>